I've seen so many clients, they'll come to me and it'll be that similar situation where it's like, am I crazy? And it's like, no, you've got a very hard line there. You're on a hard latitude. Then they eventually get that courage and go somewhere else. And it's like, why didn't I leave sooner? Everything's flowing more. Why did it take me so long to leave that area? I'm telling you when people leave, it's like the energy just shifts, you know, the life shifts. Hello, my friends. Welcome to It's All Magic. I am your guide, your host, and your friend, Devin Hine. And here, we'll be discussing how to make your life truly feel like magic. I believe that our very existence on Earth is nothing less than a miracle, and that we all have so much potential to learn, to grow, to experience, and to create during our short time here. It is both my passion and my pleasure to walk this path of life optimization by your side, where we'll discuss topics like passion, purpose, intuition, manifestation, physical well-being, and much, much more. I'm a yoga teacher, a meditation and breathwork facilitator, and a national board certified health and wellness coach. But more importantly, I am an eternal optimist, a lover of life, and a forever student. It is my hope that with each and every episode, you too, will finally start to believe it really is all magic after all. Ready to dive in? Let's do it. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I know I say this every week, but this week I am really excited to have you here. This week, we are talking about one of my favorite topics ever, astrology and astrocartography. So whether you're sitting there and you are a total skeptic who thinks that everything related to astrology and astrocartography is hocus pocus, then stay tuned. Or if you are someone who, like me, can tell you when every full moon and new moon is and how you can set intentions and have rituals around both, then also stay tuned. I let our guest today know that we have everyone in the audience along that full spectrum. Some of you who think it is absolute BS and others who love every bit of it. So we made sure to cater to each and every one of you. Today, we have none other than Helena Woods, one of the internet's top astrocartographers, which is a niche within astrology. She has written a book called Slow Living, where she talks about some of the secrets and tips to cultivating a more pleasurable, presence-filled, slow and simple life. She hosts her own courses online about astrology and astrocartography. She has two different YouTube channels between which she has over 83,000 subscribers. One of them is her own personal creative YouTube channel called Helena Woods, and the other is her educational astrology channel called Astrocartography with Helena. Both of them are incredible. I have binge watched so many of her videos and she is always entertaining, relatable, and with the astrocartography videos, she's so great at educating as well. I truly cannot wait to share this conversation with you. Cal and I actually had the amazing honor of getting a reading from her back in December of 2023. And we got an astrocartography reading with her so that she could help us decide where we want to travel, where we want to move abroad when we leave California. We were completely overwhelmed by making such a big decision. There were too many countries in the globe to choose from. And so we decided to get a little guidance from the stars. And we chose Helena out of a whole lot of astrocartographers online. And she did not disappoint. So truly stay tuned. We will be teaching you the basics of astrology if you're a newbie. We will be sharing some of our ways of combating skepticism when you skeptics out there come and say, oh, I don't feel like a Gemini. Or what about horoscopes that are so general that anyone can relate? Don't worry. We will share how we respond to those. So before we dive into the conversation, which was so much fun, I, of course, want to offer us the opportunity to take a few deep breaths. 
the breathing pattern will do today is actually called cyclic sighing. And in a 2023 study, cyclic sighing actually came out on top when compared to mindfulness meditation, box breathing, and cyclic hyperventilation in terms of how much it calmed the nervous system and lowered the respiratory rate. So this is a big deal. If you want a quick and efficient way to calm your nervous system and feel a little better, you might want to try cyclic sighing. So cyclic sighing is where you take two inhales through the nose. First, you're going to inhale almost halfway, filling up your belly, and then you're going to take a second inhale, filling up your chest, and then you're going to sigh it out. You can either breathe it out of your nose or your mouth. I like to do my mouth, so that's what we'll do today. So if you would like to close your eyes, I want to invite you to do so now. And if you don't have the opportunity to close your eyes, as I always say, you will still get the benefits of the breathing pattern. Okay, let's just take one full breath together before we begin. So breathing in through the nose, filling up all the way. Open mouth, let it go. (sighs) Okay, here's our double inhale. Inhale once. And again. Sigh. Let's do four more. Last one. Beautiful. Coming back to a normal breath and fluttering open the eyelids. Oh feeling so good. I'm feeling ready and I'm excited to share this conversation with you. Okay, buckle up for the ride, my friends. I know you will need it and enjoy. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of It's All Magic. I am so excited about the guest that we have today. She is honestly a dream guest of mine. I don't know if she even knows that. I have been following her YouTube channel for quite a long time, and Cal and I were lucky enough to get a reading with her recently. So give a warm welcome to Helena Woods, everyone. Hi, Helena. Hello, (laughs) Devin. I'm so such an honor to be on your podcast. I love all of your your energy, your magical self, your enthusiasm, and I just feel such a kindred spirit connection in you. So I'm, I'm so honored to be on your show. Thank you for being here. All of that means a lot. And I'm so excited to share your wisdom, your knowledge with my audience. As I mentioned, I am a huge fan of your YouTube channel. You share such educational and entertaining stuff, which is usually hard to come by. You usually get one without the other. So I really appreciate the creativity, the education, everything in between. And thank you for being here. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Astro cartography is like my favorite thing in the world and being able to bring the creativity to it as well. It just, it makes it more fun and more uh, enjoyable to consume. Absolutely. So before I even let you introduce yourself and share all of the magical things you do in this world, I want to start with the question that I ask all of my guests. So for you, Helena, what makes life feel like magic? The simple joys, honestly, like the simple, ordinary little things, um, especially the natural world. For me, I feel so in connection with magic and wonder and awe and that sense of appreciation, that ability to marvel when observing nature, Um, you know, whether it's a sunset or flowers, plant life, being able to connect with natural elements, um, the ocean, you know, the seasons, how, you know, life and time shows us change, literally. Um, Just connecting with those natural elements of life makes me feel so in connection with life and thus more appreciative and more magical. Yeah, I love that answer. I also feel like when we're connected to nature and we're fully immersed in the natural world, we remember how small and insignificant we are in a good way. Yeah, <laughs> it's totally. like it puts everything into perspective again. 
Yeah. And I find that when I'm out in nature, I just feel so much more connected to my inner voice, my intuition. Yeah. I feel connected to something invisible, you yeah. know, uh, it's fantastic. Um, and when I'm in cities or just when I'm more busy, when I've got more going on, it's that sense of being able to slow down, smell the roses and connect with the simple joys. It's harder to, you know, yeah. so being in nature slows everything down and like it allows me to open up more to that magic. I completely agree. Fabulous answer. Not that I'm rating these answers, but that was a 10 out of 10. <laughs> okay. So let's kick it off with something I was going to say easy. It's not always the easiest question, but I want you to introduce yourself for the people. Share a little bit about who you are, what you do. Don't worry. We'll share the whole story throughout the episode, but this can be kind of the elevator pitch, if you will. Yeah. Well, I'm Helena. I'm 29. I'm from uh, San Diego, California, where I was born and raised. Grew up in theater. Um, grew up loving, you know, being a thespian in the performing arts. Um, I moved to New York when I was 18. I dreamed of getting out of my hometown and being in a city full of culture and the arts. And I just had, I was a very ambitious kid. I moved to New York City and I lived there for five years. And I am a creative at heart. I'm a free spirit. Um, I, I, I love authenticity and realness and um, just that sense of being connected to something true and spirited and maybe a bit unconventional as well. And I moved to France, um, you know, six years ago now. And wow. I'm just kind of living the life one year, one day at a time. I lead my life from an open heart. And that, mm -hmm. that ability to like romanticize life and just go for things and follow those intuitive nudges, those little pings. And I'm just following the breadcrumbs. And that's what's led me to my life of living around the world, traveling around the world, starting my business, starting my creative YouTube channel, and then finding astro cartography and launching that. And all while I'm married to my best friend, my, the love of my life, we've been together almost 10 years now. And I just, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm really living in connection with self and authenticity and yeah, it's just magical. It's, it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing something that I love about your story and what you embody in your YouTube channel, just talking one-to-one -one even, is that you are so authentic. I know you just mentioned this so many times, but not only that, but you're authentic in what you're passionate about and following your intuition. And even if something is totally off the beaten path, but you love it, you will do it. And by you role modeling that, it, it allows the rest of us to say, oh, I can too. Totally. And so I think there's nothing more powerful than if everyone in the world just did what they love, it would grant permission to everyone else to do the same thing. Totally. That action, that aligned action with your heart and your authenticity, it's, it's magnetic and it inspires other people. And yeah, that sense of expansion. And when you see that, you know, in other people, it's, it's really, really magical. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Even when I had started this podcast a few months ago, in some of the first episodes, I was sharing what Cal and I had shared with you, which is that we're quitting our jobs, we want to travel the world, all of that. And Helena, the number of messages I got saying, I think I'm going to quit my job too. And it became this joke in my household of like, <laughs> Oh my God, anyone who listens to the podcast, everyone's going to be quitting their jobs. Is this good? Is this bad? And I just felt like if it's authentic, then it's good. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like when we see other people doing what we secretly yearn for, it almost yes. like it shows them that what they want is also possible and doable yes. and realistic too. It's not just a daydream. It's not just a fantasy of what could be. It's like, no, someone else is actually in my position similar and is doing something that I want to be doing. And that that sense of being a, a mirror, a reflection, um, we have that constantly. Every interaction, every person we see, everything is a mirror. And for the good or the bad, you know, it's always pointing us back to what we deep yearn for. And it's, it's that question of like, do we go for it or do we shame or settle or stay small when we see that expansion happening? Do we hold yes. ourselves back or do we actually take that action? It's so spot on. I recently had a guest, Dr. Shannon Smith, who shared that when you get jealous of someone, you should actually get excited, which is oh, exactly yeah. what you're saying. It's like, totally. what about them or the way they're living are you jealous of? And how can you just incorporate that into your own life? You don't have to tear them down. Just make yourself glow a little brighter. 
Oh yeah. Those are expanders. Those people. Yes. I was wondering if you had that same word in your your vocabulary. Those people are expanders. Absolutely. They're showing you what's possible. They're, they're actually like gifts. They're, they're, they're helpers uh, in a way, you know? And yeah, I know when I started looking at life that way, started doing more spiritual work, more intuitive work, um, writing my journal, you know, all that self-reflection. It's like you realize that and you can't ever see life the same way ever again, you know? Yeah, it's so true. Oh my gosh. Okay. We clearly have a lot to talk about, but (laughs) you won't be surprised because I have Virgo and Mercury. I like to keep it very systematic. I have kind of a bullet point by bullet point list of where I want to touch on. So we'll eventually get through everything. But I want to start at the beginning, not with your story, but astrology. So before we even touch on astrocartography, which of course is the type of reading Callan I got from you and you love it, it's your greatest love in this life, I want to start with astrology because in my audience, I have everyone from... I love astrology and I can tell you exactly when Lionsgate portal opens up. I have people somewhere in the middle that are like, I know what my sun, moon and rising is because my best friend has co-star and they told me. And then we have people that are like, I don't understand how we can learn anything from the stars. I think it's all hocus pocus. So we're going to cater to every person on that spectrum today. That is the hope and goal. So let's start with truly the basics of astrology, the definition of astrology. So when I say definition, I mean when an astrologer like yourself is making predictions or making some sort of psychological assessment of someone, what are they using? What are they doing to make those predictions and assessments? What are astrologers reading? What's in the sky for us? Yeah, totally. Oh, that's such a good question. So astrology is the correlation between celestial bodies and earthly events. So it's it's like it's a mirror or reflection of what is happening out there and how is that telling us or reflecting back to us that which is happening on earth. And astrology is really just pattern synthesis. We're measuring and studying cycles and cycles repeat themselves. So for example, each planet has an archetype of what it represents, you know, like Pluto rules, control, government, transformation, shedding, purging, starting over. Uranus, for example, the planet that rules technology, innovation, science, right? Breakthroughs. When we have certain planets making configurations or when they're aspecting one another or moving in a certain way together or apart, when they're making those relationships, they are signaling what is happening on Earth. And this is looking at mundane astrology, which is predicting world events, you know, everything from the beginning of time. And astrology has been around since like the first century BC. It's an ancient practice. Mesopotamians used it, the Egyptians, the Greeks. Um, And I personally practice Hellenistic astrology, which is like traditional ancient astrology. Um, But we can see that people have been tracking cycles and patterns with the cosmos versus what's here on earth for for so long. And we can use this in our own life too, on a personal level. Um, We can track history and events in in life, in the news. Um, And it's just an amazing tool. And I think that's the thing to kind of think about astrology. Astrology is never making something happen. It's never causing you to feel a certain way or because Mercury's in retrograde, you're feeling like you're forgetful or you're making mistakes, but rather those planetary archetypes, those configurations, they're just reflecting that which is already happening. It's already is. Um, it's kind of like thinking that they're messengers, you know, they're they're communicators and they're sharing, sharing a message to us here on earth. And so I love to use the clock on the wall analogy of like the clock is not making it 2 p.m., but it's signaling that it is to right now. And that's how I think of astrology. It's really we're just studying patterns and cycles and trends. I love that answer. Thank you. I've never heard it said like that. I've just, I dove right in as soon as I started learning about astrology. So I like going back to the basics and hearing that. And something it made me think of, quite honestly, I was listening to this mental health podcast the other day, and she was saying that from the time she was young, she had struggled with feelings of, you know, anxiety, panic, depression. And yet it wasn't until she had 
the verbiage, the words to explain how she was feeling, that it actually helped her learn, well, what are the signs of panic in my body? And then how can I combat that so I don't panic? And so I think what mental health and astrology have in common is that the skeptics, if you will, will say, oh, well, because you told that person they're anxious, they're anxious. Or because you told that person they're a Virgo who's going to love organization and bullet point systems, they feel that way. And I really don't think that's the case. Yeah. I think it just gives us the the verbiage, the lens through which we can understand the experience that we're already experiencing. Totally. And that's, you know, looking at those planetary like symbols and what they mean, it's all a language. And unless, until you read the language and learn what it all means, it's all going to be confusing, you know, and that's l- being able to read the language, but then also noticing cycles. Like why does every time the sun enters Pisces, right? Every time it's Pisces season in March and my Saturn's in Pisces, why am I always feeling so low every March? Why is it for years and years, this is a consistent pattern. Um, And then you see, oh, I got Saturn literally in Pisces. The sun is hitting that Saturn, which represents feeling a little bit more, you know, inward, a bit more serious, a bit more stoic. And so it's as simple as tracking that, those patterns and also knowing the language. Yeah. So well said. Thank you. So you've mentioned Uranus. You've mentioned Pisces. You've started getting into some of the lingo, which is where I want to go next. So for people that know a little bit about astrology, so maybe that person I mentioned in the beginning who their best friend has co-star and said, oh, your sun is this, your moon is this, your rising sign is this. Those are kind of the big three you hear about all the time. Can you break those three down and explain the differences and kind of how they relate, how those three make up a human being? Yeah. The most important part of a chart is your ascendant or your rising sign because the ascendant or the rising is you. It literally represents your physical body, your identity, your sense of self, and how you see the world. Literally, your lens and perception, how you approach life. The next thing we would look at is the sun. And the sun is a lot of people think that they're their sun sign, but the sun is actually your willpower. It's your goals, your aspirations, what you're going for in life, where you're shining in life as well. It shows kind of that compass toward like what area of life are you really focused on exploring in terms of goals and and your will. It's also your vitality. And then we have the moon, which is what you seek nourishment in. So the moon shows us, you know, specific things like self-care and nourishment, our emotions, our needs, our desires. What do we need deep down? Um, I often like to use the meta- I like to use the metaphor of a house. You've got your uh, your your front door and your garden. That's kind of like your rising sign. You are the house. You know, you are that front door. You're that sense of like the foundation of you. But you enter that front door. And also people see that rising sign first as well, because the rising sign is your physical body and what you look like, as well as yeah. the energy that people see when they meet you. So yeah. the rising sign is so big, but then you open that front door and you've got some friends in there in the living room having a party. The living room is like the area where people People start to recognize as they get to know you, as they start to get to know you, they start to feel and see that sun sign, you know, your energy, your vitality. Then very few people go to the bedroom, right? Or see like the office in the back of the house. That's like your moon sign. It's the private part of you that maybe not a lot of people see unless you have the moon and like, this is going a little bit more advanced, but like the 10th house of career of public visibility, unless you've got like the moon in the 10th, no one's really going to see that moon. Um, So I kind of like to use that analogy for people to like first understand those three parts, but the main biggest one is the ascendant because that's, that's you. Yes. Thank you for saying that because, you know, growing up so many of us, for anyone listening out there and I've already lost you, don't worry, we're, we're trying to bring you along, but I was going to say, when you're at a dinner party and someone says, what are you? What's your sign? Of course, that's your sun sign. And so most of us grow up thinking, oh, I'm a Leo, I'm a Scorpio, I'm a Gemini, whatever. And that's kind of all you see to your psychological assessment. But when I started learning about my rising and my moon, I'm sure you've had these moments, Helena, but I would I would sit there reading an astrology book, almost crying to myself, like, 
they see me. And by they, I guess I mean the stars. (laughs) Like (laughs) they get me. And I have found such self-love and affirmation and clarity and guidance by learning more about my chart, even starting with those three. Granted, there's a lot more to it. We will touch on a little bit more in a second, but those three, just to share for anyone listening out there, especially if you know a little bit about who I am and what I'm into, I think sharing my three really helps give clarity. You can help me interpret. I'll share what I know, but I'd love your view as well. So my sun sign is Leo, the charismatic creative performer. Just like you, Helena, I grew up dancing, singing, acting. I love to perform. I was singing and dancing from the time I was like a tiny little wee girl. And then my rising sign. So as you mentioned, your physical body, the way people see you, the first impression is Gemini. So I'm a communicator. I talk really fast. I talk with my hands. I have long lean fingers and arms and limbs and I'm moving in all directions and I'm intrigued by everything. I want to learn everything. I'm curious. The energy I'm giving off right now is very Gemini. (laughs) And then my moon, which I learned about most recently. And this one has been almost what I feel like I'm growing into, so I would love your help with your interpretation here, is Aquarius. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I've always been one of those people that would, would see this idealistic future that no one else believes yet. And it's like, I know it's there. Like society is doing this wrong. We've forgotten about these values. And I feel that strongly. And I want to create a better world for everyone. And I'm into kind of the woo-woo off the beaten path stuff, whether it's astrology or when I went plant-based like forever ago and everyone thought I was crazy and then my whole family followed. Those things feel very Aquarian to me. So tell me, how was that explanation? How, How else would you make those connections? Oh, yeah. Well, as you're describing those three, I'm literally putting that in a wheel in my head. So I'm saying, okay, the ruler of this is here. And these are this area of life. <laughs> with this. But yeah, just for like the basics, I mean, can totally see that Gemini rising. And I love Gemini. Ri- they're my favorite rising sign because I've got Venus <gasps> and Gemini. So I'm very attracted to Gemini rising people. Um, but yeah, that sense of, you know, your your Gemini in like true sense of the word, the communicator, the messenger. But that moon in Aquarius is like, moon in Aquarius is big on service. Aquarius also has this more calm, collected, humanitarian giving quality to it. You know, I think of a lot of, a lot of Aquarian energy, they love to help serve in, um, I wouldn't say a stoic way, but in this measured, calm, practical way of how can we help make a difference. And Aquarius Mm -hmm. is also all about ideas and mental, practical ways to do something. And Aquarius is also ahead of the time. It is, you know, um, it is innovation. It's, um, it's new things that are different, um, but it also is ruled by Saturn. Aquarius is ruled by Saturn. So there is that practical, grounded, let's build a foundation of something. And so the moon represents what do you need nourishment? How do you get nourishment? How do you feel like you really take care of yourself? And so I can see with your moon in Aquarius, there is that energy of like one, needing to express ideas, needing to learn Um, needing to always be expanding in thoughts and ideas, but also the desire to help people in some way, like that true selfless service of like, I want to help others. It's a huge Aquarian thing, that humanitarian, right? Um, And your moon, if you're Gemini rising, that means your moon is in your ninth house of travel, foreign lands, international cultures, as well as teaching, publishing, and the ninth house is also um, personal development. Yes. So- you know, you learning, taking classes, always expanding your mind and and traveling in some way, traveling being a part of that too. Would you say that with that moon in the ninth, do you feel lit up, expansive? And like when you do those things, you feel so nourished? Oh, Helena, you have no idea. That's That's exactly what I mean. When I said I learned about my Aquarian moon and I suddenly felt like that was the missing piece. So not only that, but I have a stellium in Aquarius. So for those listening, that means you have three or more, right? In the same 
a mm-hmm. sign or house. So yeah. I have a stellium in Aquarius and a stellium in house nine that you just mentioned. So from the time I was little, 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 I've always loved, you know, practicing teaching and writing when I was maybe five or six years old, I remember going with my sister and my grandmother to the dollar store. And my sister, who is a total tomboy, instantly ran over to those junky little trucks. So that's what she got. And I got myself a journal. And so I've always loved writing, speaking, those kinds of things. But the travel piece, what's so interesting about that, even looking at my childhood, we used to move pretty much every year of my life. My dad would be either promoted or change jobs or whatever. So we moved states every single year of my life until I was eight. And when I was six, we had actually just moved to San Diego, where you're from. And my sister was like, oh gosh, finally we can root down. I'm done with this. Six months in, Helena, only six months in, I looked at my mom and I said, mom, I'm bored. When are we moving again? Like I constantly need new terrain, new ideas, new something to challenge me. Like I, my mind is so restless. Very air. (laughs) Yeah. And not only that, but your Leo son, your goals, your aspirations, what you want, it's in your third house. Communication, right? Well, the third and the ninth houses, they're the communication houses, but they're also the travel houses. Ninth house is more like international, foreign lands, long distance moves, um, big picture thinking, philosophy, consciousness, personal development. Third house where your son is, is like the exchange of ideas, like conversation. (laughs) blogging, podcasting, very third house. Um, Third house is also short-term moves, like local road trips and local communication in more short form. Um, But it's also that messenger. And so you have two of your most important planets, plus that stellium, in those communication and travel houses. It's a huge part of who you are is that third and ninth house axis, which is the communication travel houses. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love hearing that. Even when I started the podcast, when I was explaining it to one of my friends who likes astrology, I said, I mean, just look at my big three. I said, and of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but in my more basic understanding, I said, okay, Leo Sun. So performer, I want to perform and be able to share from the heart, my big Leo heart and, you know, be of service. And how do I do that? Okay. So Gemini rising, I'm going to be communicating. And then Aquarius moon, it's going to be service. It might be a little bit ahead of the times or off the beaten path. The ideas that I'm sharing might be a little different. And so that was at least my very basic way of understanding, wow, that's why this feels so aligned. I feel like I'm finally figuring it out. Oh, and that's that's so helpful for astrology, you know, with astrology, because people you get that clarity you and it's like we all know this within us and i'm a big believer in like using astrology in tandem with intuition and when you trust yourself and when you trust your gut and your knowingness you're already living your chart you know even for those that don't practice astrology as long as you're living in total connection with your authenticity and you're trusting yourself you're literally living everything right and and on honoring that and accepting that but For those that are still seeking and and understanding themselves and what they're here to do and their purpose and their job and their relationship with others, astrology is a tool to help give you that clarity of what it is you came here to do. And that's why I always love to look at the ascendant and also the ruler of your ascendant. So my question for you is, where's your Mercury in your chart? Do you know what sign it's in? My Mercury is in Virgo. Virgo. Okay. So that means your Gemini rising. So Sag... So your fourth house, right? Your fourth house. Or wait, yes. And, and my Venus is in Libra in the fourth house. I have those two in the fourth house. Oh, so I don't oh, know if that's helpful. Yeah, because the fourth house is like roots and like family and home. And like um, it's also, um, you know, the connection to personal life. So a big part of your sense of self as well, that ruler Mercury, wherever that's placed, it's showing you more about what you came here to do on an individual in, like identity level. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where we kind of go more in depth into rulership where it's like, you know, seeing the connection with the 10th to other areas of life. And you start putting those pieces together, those puzzles, and you can start to see a bigger through line and a bigger story. 
Absolutely. So I want to pause here because we're talking about houses, signs, planets, all the stuff that I could be here with you for hours talking about this. But I want to take a step back and if you're willing, could you please explain planets versus signs versus houses? Yeah. What are they? Is there an easy way to remember what role they each play in your life? Mm -hmm. So celestial bodies are the planets. They're literally like the planets in the sky. I like to think of them as the actors. Let's say if you had a play, right? The actors are like the planets and they're performing as a character and that's the sign placement. So the sign is kind of flavoring and coloring who this character is that the actor is playing. So how does that character perform? How does it act? How does it react to things? How does it respond to things? Is it helpful in the way that it does the action of what that planet is, right? Um, So that tells us more context as to how that planet uh, moves about in life, the way they do it. Then we can look at the houses, which are kind of like the setting of the play. So the environment, the scene of the story, the house is showing you what area of life that's in, whether it's your career or marriage or home or money. We can see that environment or that house based on where is that planet performing in or that actor performing in. Okay. That's so helpful. So to kind of bring this down, just using the example that we've been talking about with, let's say, my sun sign. So the sun, you probably explained it better than I did 10 minutes ago, but I've heard as kind of your egoic identity, the the role you play a little bit. Is that kind of the sun? It's your ego, but it's also your energy and your vitality. Okay. So your ego, your energy, vitality. So that would be the actor, right? So everyone is going to have an ego and energy of vitality, but the way that it expresses itself or performs in that play will be different. So my energy and vitality is Leo, which is very bright, creative, charismatic. I'm here world. I want to I want to share my heart with you. Yeah. And then the house placement we said is house 3, which is communication, ideas, kind of the rational mind. I think it's ruled by Gemini, right? So yeah. very learning. Ideas, very mental. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so yeah. that even makes sense with I express my creativity and my love for performing and being here of service through communicating ideas. And that's yes. literally what I'm doing in this very moment. Yes. You're literally living it. You're living that needle promise right now. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I feel like it's just helpful to use a real life example of how the planets, the signs, and the houses work. But I totally. love all of your analogies. Keep them coming throughout today's episode. <laughs> yeah. And if you guys, you know, any of you listening who are looking to, to do this, I, I really recommend a book called Astrology Made Easy by Yasmin Boland. It's a really great beginner book book for understanding, you know, your chart and what it all means and putting all these basics together. Okay. Beautiful. One last kind of astrology basic that I want to touch on because for me personally, it blew my mind and I'll explain why in a second, is the elements. So simple and yet so profound. And the reason why it blew my mind, I want us to break this down in a second, but it's because I grew up knowing I was a Leo, which is a fire sign. So I only associated myself with fire until I realized I had far more air in my chart than I have fire. And then I was like, oh my gosh, it makes sense. So do you mind breaking down what are the four elements? What do they kind of symbolize? What's the archetype of each element? And then if you could just name the three signs for each element, that would be wonderful. Yeah. So there are four of them. Earth is grounded, stable, enduring. It doesn't give up. It's very steadfast. It's kind of like the snail that's constantly moving very slowly. They're kind of like the foundation blocks or builders, um, that sustainable energy. That's Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. Um, then we have the, the kind of, um, the fiery signs and the fire is initiatory. It's self-starter It gets things moving. Um, It's passionate. It's alive. Um, It's also that sense of, um, you know, spiritedness. And so we have um, Leo, Aries, and um, Sagittarius. So those are the three fire signs. They're like the self-starters and going. 
Then we have air signs. Air signs are all about ideas, changeability, and they're the most flexible. So air signs have that kind of mental component to them. So air signs are like the most, they're most idea focused mental, but they're also the most flexible and the most spontaneous and they really go with the flow. Um, but they're the most thought oriented. And so we have Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra. And then we also have the water signs. The three water are Scorpio, Pisces, and Cancer. And they're the most fluid in the sense that still, it's kind of like that still waters run deep or that emotional sense of emotional connection, receptivity, and that fluidity of change of emotions. Um, they're also the most um, sensitive um, and there's a lot of compassion with water signs. So when you kind of think of these four elements, think of what they literally represent. Like fire is that passion, that sense of spark, Earth is the most grounding and solid and stable and not changing. Air is the opposite of Earth in the sense it's always flexible and changing. And then um, the water is that kind of nourishment, that sense of um, being held, that, that sensitivity and that emotional center. I love that answer because Cal is an air sign, at least his sun sign is Gemini, and he is the most Gemini. And I think that's also one of the things or one of the reasons why we get along so well. We have that shared air, that restlessness, that curiosity. And he grew up in a family that is all air and earth mainly. And so when he first spent a full weekend with my family, and here's a little context for my family. My mom's a Sag, my dad's an Aries, my sister's an Aries, and I'm a Leo. We are all four fire signs. And so he spent a weekend with us. At the end of the weekend, Helena, I was saying bye to him. He was getting on the train and he just looked at me and he said, I feel like I spent the weekend in a den of Vikings. I was like, what? <laughs> so it's with us for years that when we spend time, even for me too, because I spent so many years not living with my family anymore. When Cal and I go spend, let's say, the holidays with my family, I can feel the fire. And then we'll go to his family's house and things are a little calmer and people don't have the same need to speak their crazy mind and debate every topic. And it's really interesting. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so cool to kind of connect with that energy and you could feel it from people. Absolutely. It's so funny. You're all fire signs. All fire signs. It's crazy. So I want to also speak to the skeptics for a second, because we've been going deep into the houses, the planets, the signs, how it can grant us this guidance, this clarity. So there are two main arguments that I hear from the skeptics in my life all the time. And I know that I have my way of kind of combating those remarks and defending astrology, but I want to see what you would say to them. So the first one is the classic of, I don't feel like a Gemini. So when you hear that, that I don't feel like a Libra, how do you respond to that? You're not just that sign, you're multiple layers, you're multiple things to you. And that's based on your birth chart. So if you don't identify with one piece of your chart, there's a lot more at play. When people meet me, they think I'm very Gemini-ish. That's only because my Mercury and how I communicate is in Gemini, right? So it's like you take one piece of it, but that doesn't mean that that's you. And that's, you know, that one piece of, is you, there's a lot more at play and you're looking at an, an entire life, an entire biography, an entire story. And so, um, the thing is not to really identify too closely with any one piece, but kind of allowing it to be there. And also that open-minded receptivity to, um, the many different layers of yourself in your chart. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. That's exactly what I like to say, but you said it way more eloquently. So thank you, Gemini Mercury. <laughs> so the second is one of my friends brought this up the other day. They said, what about the Barnum effect? So the Barnum effect, I had to look this up, is when you tell someone something that is general enough that anyone can relate. One of those. I'm sure you've heard that. So how do you respond to that skeptic? Um, astrology is not general at all. It's actually incredibly specific. 
Um, certain planets only mean certain things. Certain transits only mean certain things. It's also like the houses or those areas of life that we were talking about. The fifth house is literally only children, creative self-expression, sex, and um, yeah, children, right? So you can't say that the fifth house is about career when it's literally not. The fifth house is literally one of those things. So um, the thing is to kind of look at astrology in the sense that um, it's not general. It's actually super specific. Um, and that's why getting as detailed as looking at timing and things like that, you can literally see that happen. And so... Um, you know, the going back to the idea that astrology is actually very specific and there's certain key words and certain things that are that are um, pertinent for each planet, every sign, every house. And so um, I think the problem is when we try to make it into something that it's not. And sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll have that when I'm doing client readings, like I'll tell someone the energy is this and they'll be like, oh, maybe it's this. And I'll tell them, no, it's not. <laughs> right. Because we it's kind of that realistic going back to that groundedness of being that neutral observer. And I think the biggest detriment to astrology and when you're going into astrology is being really emotionally attached to something. I think emotion is one of the most difficult things when we're approaching charts and transits in a very emotional way, because we get attached to certain things instead of seeing that stoic neutral observer perspective. That's so critical to being a good astrologer. And so, um, with the Barnum effect, it's like being able to take a step back and looking at that zoomed out perspective, I think is so key. Um, and the difficulty with astrology in this day and age that we're living in this Neptune and Pisces time, which started in 2011 and it's until 2025, this is the age of astrology, tarot, law of attraction, all those things. Like this is the time of it. Yeah. And you know, um, the, um, the difficult thing with Neptune and Pisces is that sense of pop culture taking over astrology, you know, just looking at your sun sign, those general horoscope columns on like 17 magazine or wherever, those things can actually be really difficult for the actual science and practice of astrology, which is so um, systematic and technical and it's based on degrees and it's based on configurations. And so I always am really cautious of things like Instagram and social media when it comes to astrology, because it, it gives astrology a bad rap. And, you know, this is a time right now that we're actually in as a collective right now with the Saturn meeting up with that Neptune of that whole astrology time we're in right now, where there are more skeptics now more than ever with Saturn meeting up. And there is that time of being a bit more skeptical and looking at the groundedness and the reality of it. And I think going back to the, the basics of it's so specific, look at the degrees that is so, so helpful. Um, and, and reading the texts, you know, looking into history, looking into cycles, looking into patterns with when world events. And when was the last time that this configuration happened? Um, that I think is one of the best ways to learn. That's a great idea. I hadn't thought about lining up planetary movements with world events. Like why did that war happen? Is there anything in the stars that might have alluded to that? That's a great idea. And I was also going to say with this skeptical friend of mine who brought up the Barnum effect, I saw him a few weeks ago. He's actually a good friend of Cal's. And through this conversation, Cal and I were trying to explain a little bit more about astrology to him. Oh, this is our basic understanding of sun, moon, rising. And just for fun, we tr I try not to do this. I'm sure you're like me because it's very stressful. But I said, I bet we could guess your sun, moon, and rising. We knew his son. And Cal and I decided to kind of co-parent that decision, if you will. So he took the moon and I took the rising. And I thought out loud and I said, okay, when you picked us up from the airport today, you instantly started talking. You are a talker and you're interested in kind of the gossip and the drama and you can talk really fast and I said, I'm actually going to guess you're a Gemini rising. And then Cal was able to pinpoint for his moon that he has a lot of emotional needs met by family and kind of the cozy home and all of that. And he started feeling, I think it's cancer. And we looked it up and we were spot on. And so I just like to give those examples when someone is like, it's just too general. You could say, hardworking self-starter and most people are going to be like, that could be me. Yeah. And, but if it is, it's not general, like you said, 
And the fact that even though it can be tricky, but someone's planets and signs could sometimes be guessed. I mean, if you really put the time and energy in, th that's not magic. That's literally yeah. just science. Yeah. Yeah, seriously. And it's, it's amazing, you know, when you just meet someone or I was actually watching a YouTuber the other day, I was like binging all her videos and I, I sent her a message on Instagram. I was like, are you a Virgo rising? And she's like, yeah, I am. It's like, you could just pick up on this stuff when you start hearing people talk and you just, you know, it's, it's amazing. It's very specific. Virgo yes. is so different from Taurus. Virgo is so specific, you know, Gemini is so specific. And, um, there's a really great podcast. I'm like recommending a bunch of stuff, but if you, for any skeptics out there that are like, ah, I don't know if I believe in this. Um, first off, maybe it's not for you and that's okay. You know, I never, ever try to persuade or like make people interested in this. Cause it's just like, it's not, you know, what we're here to do. Um, but also, uh, check out that podcast episode by it's called the astrology podcast. Okay. And there's a great episode on like how to explain astrology to skeptics. I think it's like a two hour conversation, but it's so good. And my husband is a skeptic of astrology. He like, doesn't, you know, um, he doesn't, uh, follow it at all. And I was showing him that podcast and he was like, yeah, like it makes sense. Like, so listen to that podcast. I think it'll be really interesting. Oh, I absolutely will. Cause I have a lot of family members that when I say I want to become an astrologer, they're like, uh, what do you want to do with your life for money? Like for real? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, astrology, I mean, it's a booming business. Like you could do so well as an astrologer. It's, it's a field that, um, you could do very well in, but also it's a field that like, it's really of service. I can't tell you the amount of people that are helped and supported and feel like they have so much clarity and peace of mind and knowingness when they leave a consultation. It's, we need more astrologers now more than ever because more people need help and clarity and insight and grounded guidance and astrologers are able to give that. It's an amazing yeah. way to be of service. Absolutely. Well, something that is super exciting, I actually signed up the other day for a four to five month training program that starts next month. So I'll do that. And then once I have done that, I plan on doing your astrocartography course. So I want to oh, kind of oh. tend on those two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and locational astrology, right? Astrocartography, that's its own niche thing in astrology because there's so many different types of astrology where you can make predictive um, you know, analysis of things like health astrology, forensic astrology, world events in astrology, right? But I specialize in locational astrology, which um, that's how we met. That's exactly where I was going next. So obviously talking about astrology helps to kind of set the the framework for where we're going. But astrocartography, as I mentioned earlier, is I know your greatest love in this life right next to Alex <laughs> and travel. And so I first I would love for you to just explain what is astrocartography and how is it different from just astrology, if you will. Astrocartography is basically the astrology of place and location. So just like we have this needle promise of our birth chart and we can predict things based on our lives when we see these this timing play out, these patterns, we also have energies in the world that are pertinent for us. And certain parts of the world, number one, feel differently. And we can see this just by taking an hour car ride south or going to a new destination. We can see literally how we feel so differently when we visit different places, but also places have stories and certain locations in the world have something important for you. And when you go to these different parts of the world, you can connect with that theme, that energy, and also that storyline that's played out for you. And so I specialize in location in the sense of helping people go to where it's nicer, it's easier, where people can have career success and visibility, where people can find the love of their life or meet people where there's areas where there are more uh, important, significant events in terms of meeting others, we can literally see this on a map. We have a map of the world that has all these lines, longitudinal lines and latitude lines crisscrossing across the globe. And these lines tell us those stories about where we can find different things and also connect with different energies. And it's an amazing tool. It changed my life when I first learned about it, when I first moved to France in 2018, because by that point, I I had traveled all over the world. I had lived in so many places. I had terrible experiences in certain places. I felt differently in others. And it's amazing how when you look back at your life and you see all these places, how the events line up so specifically. 
Yes. Something I would love for you to touch on. I was watching one of your videos the other day and you were sharing that your business that you had even tried to kind of get off the ground in New York. I think it was photography, if I remember correctly. Yeah. That no matter how many Instagram courses you took, no matter how hard you tried, it's like it just wasn't happening. And then everything shifted when you moved to France. Can you talk a little bit more about that shift and in general, how astrocartography can make someone's life easier? Yeah. Well, when I lived in New York, that line that I have going through New York is all about the promise of meeting someone, like important people in your life, connections, networks. And so that was something that thrived for me was like making friends, meeting my husband, starting to build relationships with friends and people. But the thing that was really difficult was my career visibility, not having recognition for the work I was doing, that not being built, no matter how much work I put in and how much money I spent, how much time it never got off the ground. And it was because a lot of the energy in that chart was about the sixth house, which has to deal with more like your day job and the work that you're not visible for, not seen for. And it was actually when I moved to France, when all of that shifted, when I moved to France, my entire chart moved. And that's what's called a relocated chart, which shows you your birth chart stays the same. But the thing that shifts are you now get different detail or activations or energies in different areas of life. And so when I moved to France, the good luck symbol hit my MC, which is public visibility and being seen recognition work. Right. But I also had all these amazing planets in the ninth house of astrology and publishing and foreign travel and teaching all these good things went to those areas of life. And It's amazing how seamless it was too. And the thing I'm passionate about teaching others is that, you know, following your intuition, that's going to take you where you're meant to be. And you don't need to worry about being in the wrong place. Wherever you're meant to go, you're going to get there and you're going to activate that needle promise. And for me, it was something I didn't even know about. I didn't know about astrocartography when I moved to France or how the relocated chart shifted. It just happened. It just flowed. It was easy. Now looking back, it's like, wow, all the things line up. And I'm excited for you too, because you've got amazing things. And in Thailand, I was looking at your chart earlier and it's like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited for you. And yeah, yeah, it's an amazing tool. Yes, it absolutely is. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Thailand because as I think I told you via email, no, I'm so glad you said it. That is definitely the first destination that Cal and I will be going to because, I mean, you gave us so much clarity. Before we saw you, as we had explained, we had the whole globe to choose from. You know, we had just quit these jobs. We're going out on a limb. We're going somewhere, a one-way plane ticket. And yet there are almost too many countries to choose from. (laughs) It's like, well, we could do kind of the cute cobblestone streets in Europe. We could do curry in Southeast Asia. We, there's so many things. And so going to see you truly gave us the data-driven, evidence-based guidance that we were searching for. So if you don't mind, do you remember some of the details around kind of the Phuket, Krabi Island area of Thailand for Cal and I, and why that's such a positive hotspot for us? Totally. Well, for you, you have two lines going through that area. One is the sun midheaven, which is all about career aspirations, visibility, promotional work, and being seen and recognized. There's a sense of that Leo sun shining at the top of the chart where it's at that most visible point of the public and career and vocation and impact and all of that one of the most powerful spots to be at, but you also have your moon icy line and the icy line, that angle represents home and family and connection to place. The moon icy line is the number one hands down line where people tend to feel very um, grounded, rooted, and there's a sense of belonging and connection to land, to roots, to place. And so what's cool about your chart is that sun and moon are always together somewhere in the world and different points in the world because you were born under a full moon. And that's that sun on one side and the moon opposite that. And full moon people, 
They're here to take credit, to be seen, um, but also to be in the public eye. They're here to bring truth and what is hidden to light. And it's a place of exposure. And so when you're literally going to that sun career line and you also have the moon on a full moon point, there's just this sense of being able to manifest through exposure and putting things out there. And so that was a big thing, you know, to focus on with you is that career growth. But then for Cal, he has a Mercury IC line in the fourth and Mercury IC lines first off are great for working from home, you know, um, learning a new skill, a new, um, you know, technical skill, um, anything that you're learning, you know, being at home, being rooted, there's some sort of maybe taking classes or learning things. Um, that's really nice. And he's got that Mercury learning right there in the fourth house, but he also has a sun Jupiter latitude line. So those other lines we were talking about are those big, like longitudinal astrocartography lines. They're really big power lines, but we can also look at like, which latitude do you go to? Do you want to go a little bit more North? Do you want to go a little bit more South? Do you want to be in Phuket or do you want to go up to Bangkok, right? Different latitudes. He has a sun Jupiter parent in that Southern part, which is like confidence, high self-esteem, um, achievement. There's a sense of just feeling very confident and that sense of, you know, courage and success. And there's that easiness with that sun Jupiter latitude. So I love that crabby area for you guys, because both of you were strong. Yeah, I love that. I'm, I'm so excited to experience that shift because even in our reading, when you saw that we live in California, I remember you asked, has California been difficult for you guys? And we both kind of nodded. For Cal, he's had a really stable job, but he's had one job since graduating college and it's been stagnant, I would say, at best. Whereas I have tried so many different businesses, career options, much like you with your photography business in New York. I've taken Instagram courses. I mean, I have worked my little buns off and it felt like nothing ever worked, nothing ever stuck. And it breaks my heart to say that because I do love California. It's home to me, the redwoods, the mountains, the blue skies, even in January. It's beautiful, and I know you must feel the same way having been from the same state, but when I actually ask myself, what is best for us and our growth and our success and our service to the world, it means we have to go, we have to leave. And so it was, it was helpful to hear it from you as opposed to, even though we both have strong intuition, it can be hard to say, oh, wow, okay, it just feels like we gotta go, but to hear from you and saying, wow, that's a really challenging place for you guys felt like, thank goodness we're not crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I think you were living, you're living on a Saturn line in California, right? Saturn. Yes. Yeah. Saturn is slow moving. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of hard work. You're putting in a lot, but it's, it's not that ease filled growth. It's that sense of delay, responsibilities, obligations, duties, but also that sense of a slowdown and that restriction or a barrier or a block. Um, and so Saturn lines tend to be really difficult for people. Um, depends on the natal Saturn, but regardless of the placement, it's still like effort and, and work regardless. And, um, yeah, that's, it's challenging. And I've seen so many clients, they'll come to me and it'll be that similar situation where it's like, am I crazy? And it's like, no, you've got a very hard line there. You're on a hard latitude then they eventually get that courage and go somewhere else. And it's like, why didn't I leave sooner? Everything's flowing more. Why did it take me so long to leave that area? And Saturn lines are places where people can feel a little bit more stuck because Saturn is very like, like solid and sturdy and doesn't want to move, doesn't want to give up. And it's hard for people to leave Saturn lines often because there is that, that groundedness of what not wanting to go. But I'm telling you when people leave, it's like, the energy just shifts, you know, the life shifts. Yes. And thankfully, because of my stellium in house nine, which is the, the traveling, the publishing, I've wanted to go for a long time. I'll just say I like radical shifts. I don't know if it's my Aquarius or what, but I know they say that change is hard for everyone. And yes, it can be true to a certain extent, but I'm like a change junkie. I get really bored, really restless. I need new information, new terrain, new environments. And so when we were getting married, I would just daydream about, oh, what if we got married and then we just moved to Europe 
And I was doing research on quality of life in different European countries and cost of living. Every year in college, even, I would call my parents and I'd have a new idea of what country I'd want to move to after school. So this is, this truly does feel like a natal promise for me, especially. Luckily, Cal is down for the ride. He's, he's here for it. But it's really me that thought, I need to go or I'm always going to want to go. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, you've just got that. So in your chart, especially with that moon in the ninth, it's like, you need to travel. You need to explore to take care of yourself. That self care that needs and desires is to go long distances, foreign culture. Ninth house is also astrology, the house of astrology. You know, there's that need to like think bigger, big picture ideas. Um, as you were saying that kind of, you were talking about like needing to make radical shifts. I was literally thinking, where's your Mars placement? And do you have any connection with Uranus. Cause when, and that's what I mean when I say like astrology is so specific, like hearing the word radical shift, I'm like, okay, where's Mars? Where's Uranus, you know? And what's, what are the, the relationship between those planets? So yeah, totally. It's, it's really interesting. Yes, it is. And something I want to touch on, cause obviously we're talking about Saturn lines and moon lines and all of that. Are there inherently good lines and bad lines, or does it depend on each person's chart? Like, could someone have a really difficult Jupiter and not want to go to that line? Regardless of the placement in the chart, the planetary line, it always means the same thing. Like Jupiter always represents abundance, expansion, growth, spirituality, right? So every planet always has a certain energy and a quality about it and what it means. But some places are going to be harder or easier than others. For example, someone who's got a difficultly placed Venus, even though Venus is love and beauty and romance, they'll still be experiencing those things on that Venus line. But it might be, you know, more intense if it's on a, a Scorpio Venus. If someone has their Venus in Scorpio, that line might be a little bit more intense, more melancholy, you know, that sense of going inward transformation, the more darker tones, right? Um, so it really depends on the person's placement. But regardless, the line always has a specific archetype of what it represents. For example, I live very close to my Saturn line. Saturn was, was literally on my sense of self here. And you'd think it's so difficult, right? But my Saturn is really protected and supported. And so I actually am using the good side of Saturn, which is like discipline and responsibility and time and thinking about time and using it to my advantage, right? So it's like, even though I'm on a Saturn line, which can be difficult, especially when you've got hard transits, which is more of the timing component, um, the, the, the planet is better supported, for example, for instance. So I always like to look at the natal church just to see how that planet is being expressed. Yeah. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So for anyone listening right now that says, this sounds really interesting, but I can't move. Or let's say they know they're in a really difficult place. Like my mom, I was asking my mom yesterday, mom, do you have any questions for an astro cartographer? And she said, for families that have to move because of a job, which is what happened to my family, as I mentioned, every year of my life, she said, what if that location is really great for one partner and really difficult for another or for one of the children? How does someone make the most of where they are, even if they're on a difficult planetary line? And for people that can't travel, are there ways to kind of activate the energy of better lines while they're still there? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely that concept of remote activation, which is regardless of where you're at by connecting with a certain country, whether it's, you know, watching YouTube videos that are filmed in that country or meeting people from that country and connecting with them, or just having that culture, that influence through music, that way of life in your home, you're, you're connecting with that energy where you've got the amazing line in the world. But in terms of families, um, I find that you're going to be where you're meant to be, regardless of, you know, the astro cartography. Um, I really believe in the natal promise and the astrology, which is wherever you're led, you're meant to go there. And so the thing about astrology is every planet has a flip side. So there's always duality. Saturn has a good side and a dark side. Mars has a good side and a dark side. So even if you're on a hard line and the chart is really difficult for one person, you could use the energy in a different way where it's like, let's say you're on a Mars line, right? And Mars is anger and aggressiveness and competitiveness. 
you could use the benefits of Mars, which is being a self-starter, being a go-getter, being an entrepreneur, being someone who initiates action, maybe going to the gym a lot, getting physically active. So it's like, there's always a way where you can use the beneficial side of that planet. When it comes to families and couples, I usually will put one person in a good place and then the other partner in the same place where it's more neutral. So usually I don't like to put one person in a difficult place and then the other person has a good line or whatever, because um, I want to have some more balance and that, that way that one partner isn't having a really hard time. That makes a lot of sense. Even in our reading, I know there were a few places where you'd be like, oh, Devin, this is the ideal place to host your retreats and find podcast interviews. And then for Cal, it would be like, this is a good time for reflection. So it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a negative, but it wasn't like, Cal, you're going to be on fire. Your career is going to take off. So right. we noticed that patterning too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so for people that want to start to learn a little bit more about their own charts and their astrocartography maps, where do you recommend they go? Where do you like to go for a natal chart for someone to see their sun, moon rising, yada, yada, yada? And where can people go for just at least a basic astrocartography map? Yeah, you can go to astro.com. Astro.com has a feature called the Astro Click Travel Map. And you could pull up your, your birth chart and you can also see the map and see where all those lines are in the world. Um, and you could click on those lines and they'll have a little description written out so you could read it on the right hand side bar at the, uh, the right hand side of the screen. And then also if you click around on that map, there'll be a little term that says latitude crossings. Those are the latitude lines, those parents. And so that will show you which latitude to go to. Um, the other feature on astro.com, which is really cool is the local space feature, which is like local travel. So let's say you live in Boston and you want to know like which coffee shop to go to, what restaurant should I go to? What part of the neighborhood or area should I like go to the gym? or take some Zoom meetings. You can use this local technique on a micro level to see the direction of energies in your town, in your city. So using like the archetype of Mercury being communication and learning and skills and, you know, talking, you know, taking Zoom meetings on your Mercury line would be a really cool way to um, use that in a local way. Yeah. It's so fun and so practical, honestly. Yeah, and totally. Really, what's really funny, I don't think I'd mentioned this in our reading, but I had heard about astrocartography on a podcast maybe three or four years ago, was, you know, instantly obsessed, fascinated. And I went home and I went to astro.com and pulled up my map. And the only line that I could understand, because I was totally a beginner then, was my sun line. And guess the one country that I remember thinking, oh, so I think that would be good because my sun goes through it. It was Thailand. And it's so interesting that that was the one thing that stuck with me. And one other kind of funny note, because you were talking about eating the food of a place that's good for you or listening to the music. We might have mentioned this in our reading, but the reason why Cal and I live in the current apartment we live in in California is because we found this Thai restaurant that we fell in love with. And we had gone to this Thai restaurant on a Friday night with my mom, you know, a year and a half, two years ago. And afterwards I said, why don't we go for a walk? We stepped outside and right across the way, we saw an apartment building that was number 333, which is like my special angel number. It shows up all the time in my life. And Cal looked at me and he was like, oh God, we're living here, aren't we? And I was like, yes. And so long story short, we ended up living in this, town because Amazing. of a Thai restaurant. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And that's you using remote activation too, connecting with that energy wherever you are, you know, and it's so funny. You said three, 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 three is the number of communication sharing all of that. It's so cool that you like three threes. <laughs> I love that. I even had a whole episode about the times when it would show up whenever I was in a situation of please send me a sign. Like I was yeah. taking a, my national board exam for health and wellness coaching a few years ago. And when I got to the exam center, I was so nervous and I checked in on the front desk and they handed me a locker key and it was 33. And I literally looked in the sky and I just said, thank you. I know I'm going to pass. And then it went well. And so those, those moments where we can find a little guidance in the stars or 
find a, a small sign from the universe. Those moments, for me at least, are what make life so freaking magical. Yeah. Oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. It's a oh. message. And that's a great thing about astrology too, is like seeing them as messengers, seeing yeah. them as communicators, and you're just communicating with them and learning from them. That's really all it is. It's amazing. Absolutely. So before we go to our little rapid fire questions that I like to ask everyone at the end, there's one other topic that I'd love to touch on if you're down. So I had watched your video maybe a couple weeks ago about 2024 predictions based on certain planetary movements. Do yeah. you mind sharing even a couple of them here, kind of general themes that we can expect for this year based on astrology? Yeah, well, one of the coolest things is in April, April 20th timeframe this year, we're gonna have a Jupiter Uranus conjunction, which is quite rare. It's a very special alignment. We can trace this throughout history. A lot of innovation happens during these times, artistic and creative expression that's really groundbreaking, but also that sense of um, scientific breakthroughs. Um, for all of us, we're going to be experiencing it on a personal level, wherever that um wherever we have that configuration in uh, Taurus. So wherever you have Taurus in your chart, that area of life is going to be going, you're going to be going through that uh, on a personal level. But for the world, you know, I'm expecting groundbreaking, innovative breakthroughs. You know, I'm, I'm expecting scientific discoveries with food and agriculture. Um, I'm expecting to see maybe something with money or crypto or currency being a thing that's coming out around that time. Um, but scientific discovery is really exciting time for the world. And then we get into the end of the year. That's where a lot of things get crazy around election time with the eclipse and, you know, a lot of shifts are going to happen. And so what's interesting about 2024 is we're kind of in like the season finale. We're finishing up a big season uh, for the world and we're entering the new premiere of a new season in 2025 when Uranus, when Uranus enters Gemini. And that's going to be a new cycle for the next eight years, seven to eight years. And so so yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be a wild time when we get into this Uranus return. I think the United States is going to be going through a lot of intense things over the next several years. Um, but it's also a time of history that we're literally witnessing with Pluto entering Aquarius for the next 20 years. This is like technology, you know, things that we've never been able to fathom. We're going to be experiencing it like in history for the next 20 years. You know, I'm expecting huge cures for things, medical discoveries, aliens, like technology that's just so ahead of the time. We're literally going to be experiencing that for the next 20 years. Oh my gosh. You have me very, very excited, especially when you mention Uranus and Gemini. My Uranus is in uh, Aquarius, another air sign. So I feel like I'm hearing the word thriving in my future. And then you mentioned what was it? Pluto in Aquarius? Is that what you said? It might yeah. have been. Pluto that, will enter Aquarius, yeah. That sounds like a good time to a little stellium Aquarius over here. <laughs> yeah. And oh yeah, you know, if your Uranus is in Aquarius, you'll be having a um is that will that be a trine? Yeah, that'll be a beautiful like authenticity moment of like breakthroughs for you, confidence, empowerment, trying new things, innovation. It's really exciting. Amazing. Oh, count me in for 2025. <laughs> So rounding out with our few rapid fire questions. Now I say rapid fire, but you can take your time. You don't have to like give me a one word answer. So I have four. The first one is always personalized for my guests. And then the last three are always the same. So the first one, what part of your particular natal chart is your favorite? If you had to say, I know you said we try to be unemotional about it, but what makes your life the most fun? What gives you that pizzazz that you have? The Jupiter on my ascendant, just seeing life through optimism, bigger, larger than life person, um, someone that can, is really resilient and can bounce back from setbacks very quickly. Okay. I love that. So question number two, what spiritual or health practice do you do that you would recommend everyone do? It's that great. Journaling is my big thing. I know journaling is kind of one of those things that people either love or they don't. Um, but every day I write a full page and whatever comes out, whatever comes to mind, I don't have any prompts. I just write whatever 
that comes up if it's, I'm not writing any, if I, you know, if I'm writing, like, I don't know what to write, I'm still writing. There's something about handwriting and just putting your thoughts on paper. That has been the biggest thing in my life that has given me just a strong sense of, you know, confidence and that sense of belief and that sense of connection to the universe, God, whatever, you know, there, that journaling practice of having a relationship with that and writing to that all of these years since my childhood, it's, that is like the thing, but also meditation is big. Even if it's just two minutes a day, like two minutes of silence, even if it's just looking at a candle and gazing at a flame for two minutes before bed, as you're going to sleep or two minutes in the morning, as you're drinking your cup of coffee, no stimulation, just looking at the candle. That's like a big spiritual practice. I love Yeah, great reminders. And thank you for saying that you don't have to say anything profound in your journal. And you can also spend two minutes staring at a candle. Those both count. Thank you yes. for that reminder. I think we all needed to hear that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So question number three is what does the world need most right now for global healing and up leveling? Yeah. We need compassion for self and compassion for others. And the only way to have true compassion for self and others is to allow things to be, to accept what is, and still, you know, leading from your heart, leading from that place of generosity, of service, of wanting to give, even for nothing in return, like just wanting to lead from that place of heart led service. And by doing that, by, you know, doing what lights you up, what makes you feel authentically like, oh my gosh, I love this. Following your excitements, following your enthusiasm. When you do that and you honor that and you trust in whatever comes up for you that you feel called to do, when you honor that, you can then give abundantly to other people. And that compassion towards self and toward your your enthusiasm, your excitement, you then can be so compassionate to other people. So it's it's living in authentic like radical honesty and, and doing what lights you up so that you can light up other people too. Absolutely. That's like one of my favorite quotes that says, don't ask what the world needs, ask what lights you up and go do that. Cause what the world needs is people that are lit up. Light you up. <laughs> totally. totally. So, last question. What is your one wish or ask for everyone listening to this today? Trust the unknown. Like when you are in a period of time where you don't know what's coming next, just take one step, one step, no matter how small that is. And leading from that place of, I honor how I feel. I honor where I'm going and I'm trusting in this one next step to take me to where I'm meant to go. That consistency of one small single step and trusting yourself and allowing yourself to take that step over time that's what leads to miracles and amazing, you know, how you feel. It affects how you feel on a long-term level, your belief about yourself, your belief about life. Um, those small action steps are so big, but it's when we trust ourselves that we can really allow that to be present and to flourish in that. Beautiful. <laughs> I have nothing to say, but you were so eloquent. Thank you for being here today. I know I personally got so much out of this conversation. I think people listening, if they even came in with 0% astrology knowledge, they will know about their moon, sun, rising, the elements. So thank you for sharing your heart, soul, and wisdom online and here today. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. Of course. So if anyone wants to work with you, where can they find you? Yeah. So you can find me over on my website, helenawoods.com. I have a YouTube channel. I have two YouTube channels. One's like my more personal creative and then my astrocartography channel where I'm about to actually travel the world solo and vlogging my adventures, going to my different astrocartography lines with those transits. So when I see a cool transit happening in a certain part of the world, going to experience that and document it on YouTube. So, um, astrocartography with Helena is my YouTube channel. I'm on Instagram Ms. Helena Woods. And then if if you want to learn more, I have some courses, blog posts, and a free guide to get you started learning astrocartography on my website. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart and the bottom of the hearts of all of my audience members. And for everyone listening out there, we will see you next week. 
Hey friends, I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. Whether you came in as a skeptic, someone who was interested but didn't really know much about how astrology works, or as someone who knows a little bit about all of the planets, signs, houses, aspects, elements, and more, I hope that you learned at least one thing and that you feel a little bit more self-love, gratitude, and affirmation in exactly who you are knowing that you are who you are for a reason. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the podcast on the Apple Podcasts app, Spotify, anywhere you find your podcasts. And even more importantly, share this with a friend or family member. If there's a friend or family member out there who is a little curious about astrology, or perhaps you are, and they are a total skeptic, please send this their way and let me know what the feedback is. I will sign off for this week, my friends, but I already cannot wait to see you again next week. All right, bye for now.